Back in March, I discovered this pair of mute swans who had built a nest and were preparing to incubate their eggs. I made a video about the process and the first day that I spotted their signet offspring, but haven't given much of an update since then. That's because I've been going back to film them every week so that I could document those crucial first months of a wild mute swan's life. Doing this has revealed some interesting insights into mute swan family behaviour and I'm really excited to finally share it with you. As a zoologist, I know that much of what we know about wildlife comes from this kind of extended observation, so I really hope that you'll appreciate watching how these babies have grown over the months. Maybe you'll even learn something new about this common occupant of our rivers. After multiple weeks of watching the nest, I showed up one day in early May to find it empty. I held my breath as I looked around the corner, hoping that they hadn't abandoned their eggs, and there I saw the parents. Were those tiny movements a trick of my hopeful eye? Thankfully not. After days of coming back to this spot, I was able to film these tiny babies enjoying their first day in the water, closely supervised by their parents. They were probably two or three days old at this stage, having spent a couple of days drying off on land before venturing out. At this early stage, they have no obvious wing or tail feathers and a really short neck, looking much more like balls of fluff than the adult swans. Their grey colour is thought to be a signal to the parents that they still need caring for, as opposed to the white of an adult that signals a potential mate or a rival. The fathers are the first defence for this family, with the mother defending the signets from further back. At this stage, the father wasn't used to me and was wary, constantly putting himself between me and the babies, so I made sure to keep enough distance from them that they were comfortable staying where they were. Thankfully, over the following weeks, the family would grow used to my presence and allow me to get much closer. But at this point in time, while the father was protective, the mother had just spent weeks on her nest, so was much more focused on feeding. Luckily for her babies, this is a skill that they need to learn quickly, so her need to bulk up was also teaching them how to find their own food. A week later and the cygnets had already grown so much in both size and confidence. They were happily exploring further downstream, keeping themselves occupied eating any underwater vegetation that they could reach. They were safe under the protective watch of their mother, who didn't let them roam too far. At this age, they're particularly vulnerable to predators and to rival birds. Without their mother's warmth and the ability to follow her to safe resting spots, they would quickly demise just from facing the elements alone. This stage of life is all about the safe exploration of their world. Their mother, who I mentioned in past videos I suspect has raised broods before, proves herself over the next few months to be a great teacher. Here she is teaching them about how to make the best use of those long necks to not only get underwater vegetation, but also the particularly tasty stuff growing along the river's edge. Her skills as a parent are obvious, as she is not only feeding herself, but also throwing the food back so that her babies can try a new type of food. Meanwhile, their father is doing an equally important task, making sure that the river is safe for his babies. He is the male on the right and is keeping his wings raised with his neck low over his back in a clear territorial display. The male he is displaying to is actually the male I first filmed building a nest on one of my videos from a few months ago. I suspect the male on the left is less experienced since he, he and his partner had abandoned their unsuccessful nest by this point. The family that we're following hatched out further upstream and this part of the river is the boundary between the two territories that the pairs established. Now that the right hand male has signets, he's much more aggressive about keeping rivals away. He knows that if another mute swan gets close to his signets, they could kill them. His goal here is to claim the other pair's territory, to chase the rival pair away from his own family. From further upstream, where she's feeding her signets, the off-camera mother does occasionally look over to see how the display is going, but she clearly trusts that her partner can handle it because she happily continues to feed. Having been beaten in the display by some signal that I couldn't pick up, the left side male drifts further downstream. 
Behind him, you can see the second nesting attempt that he and his partner made. At this point in time, an abandoned resting site often used by napping ducks. The next day, you could really see how the cygnets were starting to turn into swans. Their necks are still short, but they've started to gain that unique S-shaped curve. You could also see how at ease the parents are. Instead of focusing on me, they were happily preening and relaxing while I filmed. During my months of filming them, I made sure not to do anything that could give them a negative view of me by keeping quiet and backing off at any signs of distress. I also made sure not to do anything that could give them a more positive view of me, like feeding them. In doing so, I made sure that they saw me and my camera as another piece of the landscape, encouraging them to act more naturally in my presence. After a while of observing them, I watched the cygnets decide to return to the water to feed again. Watch the organisation as they go in, first one pair enter the water, followed by a lone cygnet, then another lone cygnet, then followed up by another pair. Although this isn't a noteworthy observation on its own, in combination with the next few months of observations, it actually becomes rather interesting. This is the first sign that two bonded pairs of siblings might be forming, with the remaining two siblings either being more independent or being pushed out by the pairs. Another interesting observation this week is how the babies are starting to emulate their parents. Look at this signet closest to its mother, mimicking the same relaxed position with its foot as it feeds in the same way as she does, with an outstretched neck. During the next week, our male was once again signalling his dominance over the rival male. I'm not sure at which stage the other male backs down, but this is one of the last times I spotted him at this part of the river, so the male we're following does win these dominance battles. At this moment of time, however, he stays around here since his partner is still spending long stretches of time on a nest. This was the third nesting attempt that they made, and I was fairly certain I spotted eggs under her, but not long after this, the pair abandoned this nest as well, so they weren't successful. While the males battled, our female looked after her babies. Unfortunately, someone had thrown bread creases into the river, so they were feeding on that. Bread is bad enough for adult swans, but for cygnets it could be a death sentence. While a bit of bread can help supplement an adult swan during the winter, too much, especially for their offspring, is really bad. Their digestive tract can't process the refined flour, so it's similar to us feeding our children on a diet of sweets alone. This means that cygnets who eat too much bread can undergo a growth spurt so extreme that they can't stand or walk properly. The nutrition content is really low, so they can feel full without having got what they need, which can lead to starvation. Those that do survive can have further problems into adulthood, with their wings growing in incorrectly, leading to other swans picking on them. Thankfully in this instance, a few days later all six cygnets were still alive and healthy, not obviously affected by the bread feeding. Four days on from that and they looked much more like swans, their necks having elongated. However, their wings were still just small bare arms. They had also learnt to preen themselves, keeping their feathers clean and tidy. After another week, I watched as all six cygnets happily rested on the shore with their parents. On reflection, I suspect the cygnet on its own at the start of this clip is the one that isn't as bonded as the rest of the group, but at this time I had no idea of knowing that these relationships were forming. In terms of their development, you can see that they're preening their growing feathers, but that their wings still resemble stubby arms rather than adult wings. Some days when I visited the family, there were no unique behavioural observations. At the start of June, they were simply happily swimming with their parents. By mid-June, they had started to develop their wing feathers, as you can see from the cygnet stretching out its wing. Despite starting to elongate, their wing arms are still stubby and have a lot of growing left to do. At this point, the rival pair had completely given up with nesting and abandoned the territory that they'd claimed. A large group of swans spends their time around a pier much further downstream, so they may well have joined siblings there for the summer instead of patrolling a territory that they didn't need. Either way, this opened up a bigger stretch of the river for our family to forage on. As the drought set in later on, this could have made the difference between life and death for them. The middle of June also provided further evidence that one of the cygnets was being singled out, although I still hadn't realised that. Continued observations that don't seem to mean much in isolation can lead to valuable insights when combined, which is part of why I wanted to create this long filming project for you to watch. 
Although the cygnets were clearly growing, they still looked small next to their parents. During what I refer to as the cute gangly phase, you can see the fluff on the top of their heads where they're starting to lose their baby feathers, and you can see the stubby ends of their tails that haven't yet grown out into long adult ones. At this point in time, I also discovered younger cygnets elsewhere on the river. I mentioned in earlier videos that the swans we're following were breeding particularly early in the season, which is a sign of experienced parents. The parents of these new cygnets bred at a more expected time, and I enjoyed watching the mother carrying the little ones around on her back. You can really see the difference in behaviour here between the two sets of parents. This mother puffed her wings up defensively and circled the area to chase other swans away. Having so many potential rivals around would cause a higher stress response, which might be why she had a smaller brood. Unfortunately, you may have caught on to a loss in our swans this week. There are now only five cygnets following their parents. It's impressive that all six survived as long as they did, but still sad to lose one. There are all sorts of things that could have happened, like bird flu, foxes, humans shooting them, consumption of bread, the weather, or any number of other incidents. Our parent swans are only considered successful if their own offspring survive long enough to reproduce, so by having more than one baby to look after, they are placing their bets in the game of survival. Although the loss of one cygna is sad, life goes on for the rest. By the end of June, their wing feathers had really grown out. As one of the cygnets stretches, you can clearly see the definition between each of the feathers rather than just bits of fluff. By early July, you could see their behaviours start to reveal themselves. The parents flanked their cygnets, who travelled in pairs of two, with one on its own. By this age, the male cygnets are typically up to 30% larger than the females, so I expect the larger pair up front are males and the smaller pair behind are females. The lone one is also a small sibling, so I'm guessing it's also a female, but there's not really a way for me to tell until they turn around two or three years old. This is when they will enter the breeding season and the males will develop a large black bulb over their beaks. The next week, some of their adult coloration was starting to come through and it really hit me that the baby swans I had been following for months were starting to properly grow up. The white feathers were coming in primarily on the necks and wings, helping them look like proper swans instead of balls of fluff. Although their wings were still short, they had clear layers of feathers giving them defined shapes. The cygnets had a tough few weeks ahead of them, as in a week's time the UK hit its highest ever recorded temperature and these babies live in the south of England. I didn't want to walk over an hour to get to them, so skipped the next week of filming, returning to the river at the end of June. Thankfully, the whole family survived the heatwave and looked healthy when I found them next. I enjoyed watching their personalities showing through. One of the sibling pairs were communicating with each other in a way I hadn't seen them do before. Despite beginning to look like adults, it seems their parents still had things to teach them. They were building a new nest. I'm not sure whether it was because they needed one or because they were teaching their cygnets how to do it, preparing them for raising their own young, but either way the cygnets would have learnt through observation. Further evidence could be seen this week that two sibling pairs had formed, One pair went up on the nest. The lone sibling tried to join them, but gave up and left to join the other pair, who were swimming nearby. Although the parents still protected the cygnets at this point, they were focused on newer behaviours like their nest building. The cygnets had started to drift further away, but still stayed within eyesight and returned to them often. With the rival pair gone, by early August our family was exploring even further downstream, having claimed this whole area as their territory. This was the furthest downstream I'd ever seen them. Their parents were still protecting them whenever boats and paddleboarders came too close, but they were much more accepting of people's presence than when the cygnets were first hatched. I was able to film them from up close without them being bothered by my presence. Although the family continued to spend their days downstream through August, each evening they would return upstream to the area they hatched out. 
This week marked them turning three months old. At this age, they have beaten the survival odds and their parents have done an exceptional job. Half of all signets hatched won't survive this long. From this point on, their chances of survival are much higher. Although they aren't out of danger yet, a quarter of all swans who make it to three months old will still fail to reach adulthood. Two weeks later, and the signets had grown so much, they were almost unrecognisable to their newly hatched selves, now being as large as their parents and having almost fully formed wings. On the left side is our lone signet, who had just wandered over from another part of the bank. Although it's minding its own business, one of the pair that were already resting here isn't happy and has a go at it. Another sibling stretched out, displaying some gorgeous white adult feathers hidden beneath its wings. At this age, they're almost ready to start making practice flights, skimming across the water. It was really interesting to see that the backs and undersides of the wings were where these signets first started developing their adult feathers. Perhaps this is deliberate. If the parents see white feathers as a threat, then too many of them in obviously visible places might result in these signets being kicked out of the territory before they're ready to fend for themselves. Having been snapped at too many times by its sibling, the lone signet headed back to another section of the bank, only to be snapped at by the signets lying there too. Heading back once again, it seems it can't catch a break as its sibling postures, ready to strike again. Having had enough of this and heeding the warning, it heads by itself into the sanctuary of the water. As the signet swims past its parents, you can see that the bank is littered with feathers. A summer molt is important for swans, helping them maintain feather health, but it's also a dangerous time. During molt, the parents are flightless and vulnerable to predators. Normally, the female will molt first, followed by the male, so that there's always one parent capable of flying to protect the signets. Here, the female was focused fully on preening and was surrounded by the majority of the feathers. You can see her biting and pulling at the itchy feathers to get them loose. As some of you may know, I recently moved house. At the time of filming this clip, I knew I was going to be moving away, so I took some time to just enjoy watching them. I was particularly happy to see how comfortable they were as I sat less than a metre from them. It was funny to watch the one on the right, who was trying to fall asleep, but thanks to the angle of the bank, its head kept slipping off its back. By the end of August, some of the signets had grown even bigger than their parents. Some of the whites of their adult feathers were starting to poke out. Watch as their long necks are able to reach down fully to the bottom of the river, making the most of as much underwater vegetation as their parents are able to. At four months old, these signets are now at the age when they can start thinking about leaving their parents. At this young, it is rare, but it's not unheard of. It's much more likely that they will actually stay with them until next spring, when the next brood is ready to be laid, and that's when their parents will finally chase them away. They started acting more independently this week. The biggest signet showed protective behaviours, focusing in on a pair of collared doves. The way he reacts to them is a sign that he is learning what it takes to defend his own territory. One day, he will need this confidence to chase other birds away from his own signets. As one of the signets swam close to me, I was able to see just how developed it was. Its eyes and beaks now had white feathers highlighting them, and its tail was pointed with adult feathers. As one of its siblings stretched its wing, it displayed the full set of flight feathers. Although I hadn't seen them practicing, I had no doubt that they would start soon if they hadn't already. Now we come to mid-September, and my last time visiting this family of swans. A day before moving house, I walked down to get some final footage of them. It was really nice to just watch the whole family swim past. 
It's a shame that I can't watch them fully grow up, but it's reassuring to leave them under the watch of such good parents. With any luck, in two years' time, people walking this river will be spotting more sets of signets with these ones as their parents. As a final goodbye, upon leaving the river and heading downstream, I spotted the rival pair once more. Despite disappearing from this part of the river for so long, something seems to have drawn them back. They were staying a good distance away from the family, but perhaps next year they too will succeed in raising a brood. If you've enjoyed watching these signets grow up and want to see similar videos in the future, then consider supporting my channel by joining those that donate to my Patreon account. I have five different monthly support tiers to choose from, ranging from just £2 up to the higher tiers where you can vote for video topics, have your name credited at the end of each video, receive personalised art of any UK species, and get one-on-one -on -one consultation calls with me on any nature-related topic of your choice.